Griffith University is a Gold Coast institution and continues to grow. Its dynamic urban campus blending seamlessly into the region's world-class attractions. And now, partnering with the Gold Coast's cultural leader, Hotter Home of the Arts, we're proud to present our signature thought leadership and conversation series, helmed by master interviewer Kerry O'Brien. Welcome to A Better Future for All. Well, good morning, everybody. My name's Carolyn Evans. I'm the Vice Chancellor of Griffith University, co-host for this morning's event, along with Hotter, home of the arts here on the beautiful Gold Coast. I respectfully acknowledge the traditional custodians of the lands on which we meet, pay my respect to their <coughs> elders, past and present, and to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people joining us here today in person or virtually. I also acknowledge the traditional custodians of the many lands on which the people joining us virtually are gathered today. Can I acknowledge also members of the Gold Coast Council who are here with us, the Griffith University Council and Executive, and also the members of the Hotter Leadership Team. So it's a great pleasure to join you for our fourth event in the Creating a Future for All series of conversations. Our aim has been to bring you outstanding thinkers and leaders to provide their insights in complex and thoughtful ways about the future. Today's conversation is a timely opportunity to discuss what kind of future we face pending the outcome of next week's critical elections in the United States. We're joined once again by one of Australia's foremost journalists, commentators and writers, Kerry O'Brien. For those of you who followed the series, you'll be well aware of the skill and experiences brought to the three outstanding conversations so far. We're very grateful for the, the role that he's played. We are also delighted to have a highly engaged and qualified guest to join Kerry in the conversation today. The former US ambassador to Australia from 2009 to 2013, His Excellency Geoffrey Blush. An esteemed lawyer, respected diplomat and champion for education, Jeffrey is devoted to advancing international understanding around the world. He serves as chair of the Fulbright Foreign Scholarship Board and as chair of the Pacific Gas and Electric Company and is the former chair of California State University, which is America's largest university system. He's also a board member of Stanford University's Center for Advanced Studies in Behavioral Science. And most importantly, last year he received an honorary doctorate from Griffith University. He remains active in regional diplomacy today, having been appointed by former Secretary of State John Kerry to the East-West Centre Board. He also serves on the boards of RAND Australia and the Australian-American Leadership Dialogue and was elected as a life member to the Council of Foreign Relations. He's widely regarded as one of the US's top lawyers, a former law clerk to the Chief Justice of the US Supreme Court, a president of the largest bar association in the United States. He also served in the White House as special counsel to President Obama. At the same time, he has maintained a commitment to supporting the most vulnerable and needy in our society. He's represented the American Bar Association in several landmark cases supporting the rights of immigrants in the United States Supreme Court. President Bill Clinton selected him to serve as Director of White House Commission on Youth Violence following the tragic Columbine High School shootings. It's been my privilege to hear him speak on many occasions. It's always stimulating and thought provoking. I very much look forward to hearing from him today. So without further ado, I'll hand over to Kerry to start proceedings. Jeff Bleich, uh, can I add my welcome uh, to your joining this series of conversations. Before we, uh, before we dive, yes, yeah, sorry, go on. I'm sorry, I wanted to join you and thank, uh, special thanks to um, uh, Vice Chancellor Evans. I'm, I'm very touched, I wish my kids were here. <laughs> well, you can always replay it to them. Before we dive into the presidential election and try to sort out, I want to ask a question that I think should frame the whole discussion. When do you think America was at its strongest as a democracy? Oh, you know, <laughs> we, we tend to be our strongest when we come through a crisis. So I'd, I'd say as a democracy, we were um, at our strongest coming out of um, uh, the you know, or, or during the Great Depression, you know, well, if you look at uh, Herbert Hoover, who won in a landslide and was extraordinarily popular uh, with the dominant party in the United States, and um, based on his response to the Great Depression and his failure to uh, adapt government to address the, the, the needs of Americans, 
um, he, he lost in an even bigger landslide only four years later. Mm. Um, that's, a, that's a robust democracy where that many people can evaluate a president and change their minds um, uh, in, in, in such clear fashion. Mm. And it really set up a democracy which is very different um, for the next 80 years. And by comparison, where do you think it is today? Apart from the Civil War, I wonder whether the United States of America has ever been less united, not just between states, but within states. Yeah, no, this, this in many ways, there are, there are parallels to the election of 1860. And it is a reminder that, um, you know, you can't take democracies for granted. Uh, uh, when people neglect um, portions of America or neglect um, the foundations of government, uh, it can rapidly slide into, uh, in, into dangerous spaces. And right now we have a deeply divided country on a number of issues. Um, but, you know, the, the, the good news is um, that they're not indifferent. Um, they're, people are very, very animated. And I think that is a hopeful sign for what is right now a very challenged democracy. Mm. Anne Applebaum wrote in the Atlantic Monthly that, quote, epidemics like disasters have a way of revealing underlying truths about the societies they represent. What underlying truths about America have been revealed by this pandemic? Um, I think the underlying truth is our, our, our um, uh, struggle with the truth. <laughs> you know, right now, I'd say one of the biggest challenges for our country and for democracies around the world, we're not alone in this, is a lack of a common vocabulary of um, truth, scientific truth, facts, logic, um, uh, and, and trust, trust in experts uh, who we have always counted on to let us know what is true in their area of expertise. I think if you look at the the, you know, the, the challenges that we're having on a pandemic, uh, a lot of it is people don't know what to believe. Um, you know, best example is if you ask the Center for Disease Control in the United States, they'll say you need to wear a mask. Uh, it's one of the best ways to prevent COVID from spreading. If you ask the President of the United States, they'll say, well, CDC says recommend a mask. You can wear a mask. I don't like masks. And, you know, I, I hear from some people that masks actually may cause uh, COVID to spread, I don't, you know. So if you're an American, um, you don't know what to believe. Do you wear a mask? Do you not wear a mask? Um, is it up to you whether you wear a mask? Um, and when people don't know what to believe, uh, they, they either tend to default to um, biases or they believe nothing and they do nothing. What about the underlying truth uh, that there is a growing unhealthy, increasingly unhealthy divide between the rich and the rest, uh, which has been uh, already accented and will continue to be accented, I would think, in terms of those people who have felt the pandemic most and will feel the after effects of the pandemic most. Yeah, no, I think that is <laughs> true. We have, we have two pandemics going on simultaneously. Um, there is the, the um, the health pandemic, the virus, which is running around the world. Um, but it's revealing within the U.S. that um, the, this pandemic is hitting different parts of society very differently based entirely on income. And although we already knew about the great wealth disparities within our country, um, it's making it very real when you see that this is the most unequal recession that we've ever had. Uh, and it's also a, a um, and, and, and it's being borne most by the people who are working hard and are on the front line and are trying to save lives as nurses and as teachers and just being the person who works in the grocery store. Um, they are the most exposed and they are the um, poorest paid. Uh, and and when, when people start to recognize that and that they are overrepresented in immigrant communities and in, um, among racial minorities, um, those, those fault lines and those fractures within our democracy become more evident. So we'll come back to this broader discussion uh, soon, but now let's look at the election and the most likely outcome. You've seen the inside of a presidential campaign. You've run for office yourself. 
how are you measuring what's really going on? Because we know from last time that the polls can get it badly wrong. Yeah, no, I, I think um, there is this um, uh, paranoia, particularly among Democrats right now, about what is it that they're missing? You know, the, the, the polls look good for uh, not only Vice President Biden, but also for Democratic candidates in a number of battleground states, including states that traditionally have not been battlegrounds. And so uh, based on the 2016 experience, based on Brexit, uh, even based on the you know, surprise result in, the, um, in, in, in Australia, um, I think there is a general fear and caution about taking any of this as um, as true, I, I, I think if you if you're trying to be honest with yourself and just not accept the you know the the, the, the need to tamp down expectations, then you, you have to say that the numbers are what you would look for in a normal election if you were a supporter of Joe Biden. Um, he has held, you know, healthy leads in a number of key states. Uh, he is, um, those, those numbers have stayed constant for a long period of time, um, and they seem to have expanded, if anything. Uh, there are key demographics that you look at to see how he's doing in, in, in those um, uh, demographics compared to Hillary Clinton, compared to Donald Trump. Uh, you know, for example, seniors. Uh, Hillary Clinton lost among senior citizens in the United States by seven points to Donald Trump. Joe Biden is currently ahead by 21 points, um, and that's nationwide. So those numbers would give you some confidence. And then you would look and see, well, the mistakes of polling that occurred in the past, have they been accounted for? And the critical mistakes in polling last time around were undercounting and under, under polling. Um, white Americans without a college degree. Uh, and in fact, there has been, you know, a, a dramatic change in the sampling of that group. And then also under you know, underestimating of groups that might come out and vote. If anything, Democrats this time are doing it the other way. There has been a surge in voting among young people, but instead of using the 2018 figures, uh, they're looking at 2016 figures, which are more conservative. So again, conservative polling, you know, sort of good trend lines, both in demographics and in individual states. Um, Joe Biden should feel pretty good about where he is today. Um, but I think there is a sense that because um, Donald Trump has been so successful in the past in defying expectations, and there are, um, extraordinarily concerning dirty tricks going on already, um, some in plain sight and some below the surface, um, that what we are seeing may not be real. Mm -hmm. And it has created a tremendous unease and, um, and fear, uh, particularly among Democrats, but I really think across the country. So what significance do you read into the fact that that about 60 million votes have already been cast, which I think is is more than ever before at this stage of the presidential campaign. What do you read into that? Uh, well, you know, you want to look at where those votes are cast and who they're cast by and what, what zip codes they live in, because it will tell you a lot. And what you're seeing is a, uh, a, a larger than expected at this point turnout by young people. Um, by this point in 2016, 14% of um, young registered voters had cast their vote. It's 22% already. Um, so that gives you that gives you some sense that it's a 50% increase among young people. You're seeing um, um, minority vote um, come out at high levels, um, and I think in in many cases, in among minorities, it would typically vote with Democrats. Uh, so that would give Democrats some confidence. On the other hand, um, Trump supporters are being um, registered at a higher rate. They may come out in person uh, because they were told by their president not to trust mail-in ballots. Um, there could be a surge of them uh, late in the late in the game. 
And so, again, you can, you can draw some conclusions that we're all really motivated. Hmm. Um, but I think Democrats may have voted a little bit earlier in part because they were told, you know, Donald Trump may shut down the post office. <laughs> Your vote may not make it unless you, you know, send it in early. Hmm. Um, again, I think some paranoia is driving the early numbers. And in, in, and in a sense, um, you don't know whether a significant number of those were going to turn up at the polling booths anyway and vote the same way. And, and that's the big imponderable, isn't it? How many people ultimately are going to turn out? And, and the Democrats clearly need a significant number more than turned out last time. There was that conflict between Sanders supporters and Clinton supporters. There was an anti-Clinton sentiment within the, within the Democrat Party. And that is a big unknown, isn't it? Yeah, no, that, that is one of the big questions. You, in general, what you're seeing is a much more unified Democratic Party. Um, and they're not, uh, many, many people, including myself, um, have great confidence in Joe Biden. Um, but that doesn't reflect the entire coalition of Democratic voters who are animated. Many of them are driven by um, uh, a distaste for the current president. And, it's, you know, and, and it really comes down to, um, in, in some cases, a, a fear or uh, an actual hatred. I was a correspondent in America in the Reagan years, and I covered the 84 presidential election. It still shocks me. Uh, it shocked me then and it still shocks me today how much the concept of fair elections in America uh, has been corrupted over generations, institutionally corrupted in various ways by state governments to favour one side of politics over the other. What are the biggest impediments to people voting this time? Uh, well, so, you know, one of the great gifts of the American people is we are an extraordinarily innovative people. But what it means is that we have folks who got into government over time and they figured out ways to innovate, um, to gain the system of governance. And if we don't constantly correct and improve our democracy, uh, we're susceptible to being gamed and it's happened over time. There are a number of things going on right now. So there are the things that always exist, which is um, we, have, uh, you know, we have deliberate efforts to suppress the vote. So, for example, right now, um, there is a there was a ruling recently which says that um, even if you mail your ballot before election day, and it's postmarked well before election day, if it isn't received on election day, it can't be counted. Uh, you know, you you voted, you voted in time, um, and it was just held up by the post office, and you're denied your right to vote. Uh, we have other states which have said that we're only going to allow one ballot box per county, which means that tiny counties with a total population of 2,000 have a box, and then major cities with um, populations of millions like Dallas and Houston get one box um, to collect ballots. So, in um, fact, on the day, uh, on yes. the day, you could have a queue going for miles. Uh, where some people in that queue, by the time the, 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 the ballot closes, are still far away from having, being able to vote. I mean, I, th that is the kind of thing I'm talking about. When you see that kind of blatant distortion, yes. how, how is it, <laughs> if you've got such a great democracy, how is that allowed to happen? <laughs> yeah, no, no, we, we, have a, um, we have a democracy in which there, is, there has been a systematic effort over a long period of time to make it difficult for certain people to vote. Um, and, you know, in this case, it's really focused on people who live in cities, typically do vote Democrat, um, are the ones who would be most disadvantaged, as well as young people, first time voters, immigrants, people who don't necessarily speak the language well, um, would all be, um, you know, would be at a disadvantage. So for example, you've got some places where you have to put your vote in a sleeve um, before you put it in your envelope and then mail it in. And if you don't put it in the particular sleeve the right way, it doesn't count. Um, so you have those sorts of things that are being done in plain sight that are, that are suppressing the vote. You have a number of other ways in which votes are, um, you know, um, are, are restricted in just you know, gerrymandering of districts. Um, we've drawn districts in a way which mean that 
they favor one party over another and that you know one person's vote uh, in in one part of the country is going to have a you know much less impact than in another part of the country. I found yeah, I found myself musing when I was when I was preparing for this conversation. I had uh, I, I covered the Philippine elections in 1986 when Marcos uh, fund, uh, ultimately was thrown out, but only after a coup, not uh, not at the ballot box. The ballot box was clearly rigged, but there were a whole there was a whole big team of international observers under the auspices of the UN, including very senior Americans, uh, 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 including senators. That was a corrupt system, and there was that international scrutiny on that system. And I did have this passing thought, why is there not an argument for having international scrutineers of how fair and democratic the American system really is when you have such distortions as these? Yeah. Well, I don't know that we necessarily have to have um, international observers come in, because uh, one of the reasons you have international observers come in in other countries is you don't know what's been going on and how it's been gained. We know exactly how it's been gained. It's on the front page. Uh, so our challenge is a different one. Our challenge is generating the public will to have a significant change in how we, how we govern ourselves. In the 1920s, during a very similar period of dislocation, we made massive changes, including changes in our constitution that fundamentally changed how we voted. Uh, among those was uh, it used to be that the state legislatures would select the senators, and we made that a popular election so that the public could choose their senators. Similarly, up until then, uh, women didn't have the right to vote. And so with the uh, constitutional amendment establishing um, uh, suffrage, we, we doubled the number of Americans who could vote in an election, you know, in one election cycle. I mean, these are dramatic changes that happened because of a sense of that the game was rigged and there was disenfranchisement. We did other things because of corruption, uh, which had been rampant during that period, including the establishment of a civil service. I think we're due for one of those periods again, where we fundamentally fix what is, by all accounts, a rigged system. And yet, uh, and, and yet the, mood, the mood would suggest that that would be almost an impossibility, that the country is so divided. You've got this solid block of Trump supporters, almost cult-like supporters, in the many millions. And I, I, I mean, I suspect Australians take uh, the integrity of their electoral system for granted, compulsory voting, strongly uh, scrutinised by an active electoral commission and a federal voting system that the states can't tamper with. What would you give for such a system? <laughs> Look, I, I, I love the uh, Australian voting system when I was there, and then when I came back, uh, one of my great missions in the United States is to take some of the best ideas from Australia and make sure that we incorporated them into our own system. How's that I going? Believe, you know, <laughs> it's going... <laughs> well, the last four years have not been our best in terms of that kind of innovation, but I see, I see opportunity here. And, uh, and, I'm, and I'm not just being, you know, Pollyanna-ish. Um, the very first bill that was passed by the new Congress um, when Democrats took the House in 2018 was H.R. 1, which is focused on a whole series of election reforms, including public financing of elections. Just take all this dark and dangerous money out of our election system uh, and, and turn it into a fair fight where the same amount of money is available to both sides to do their advertising and know where the money comes in. That's and, and knowing where the money comes from is utterly yes, critical, it, is it not? It, it, yes, exactly. So you know where the money comes from. It comes from, you know, federal funds, and you know what the what what the money is for, and no one has, you know, some advantage uh, where they are then beholden to the special interests that paid for it. Hmm. Okay? I think there's um, so so that's one thing. Another thing is that there would be a nationwide overview of um, district, so that you would ensure that. Um, districts are properly drawn for federal elections. And there are a number of other reforms that are included in that. If you had, um, hypothetically, if the vice president were elected, and if the Senate were to flip in this election cycle, you would have a president, a Congress, and a, um, and a Senate, which you know could pass that legislation 
you know, in the first hundred days. And uh, Nancy Pelosi, a Speaker of the House, has said that would be her number one priority. Mm -hmm. Because until you get the system fixed, you can't fix all of the policy challenges that we face as a country. Mm -hmm. Now, this has all been complicated by the fact that um, within, you know, uh, I, I believe it was yesterday, uh, the president um, secured a, um, a very conservative majority of the Supreme Court. And there's a real question as to how that court is going to review and decide um, the constitutionality of um, decisions that would come out of potentially a Democratic, elite controlled, um, you know, House, Senate, and White House. Yeah, well, that's, so a, that's a huge question, that. isn't it? That's a huge yeah, question. Well, that, that's what happened to FDR. Um, he, you know, he, the New Deal, his first hundred days passed a whole bunch of legislation and uh, a healthy portion of it was found unconstitutional by um, the Supreme Court, which was extremely conservative at that time. And over time, um, again, the public kept reelecting FDR and he kept getting new appointments. And eventually um, he had a court that was more in line with his thinking about what was needed to make our democracy work. Of course, uh, this time, uh, having in mind the mood in the country, it's, it's not just critical that the Democrats win the election, is it? It's not just critical in your terms for Biden to win this election. It has to be a big win. It has to be a big win to move beyond the cries of cheating. It has to be a big win, does it not, to send a message to the Supreme Court as well? Right. I mean, again, if you want if you want the sort of change that we're describing um, in a democracy, it's going to require a big win for those reasons. But it also you need a, a, a big win for another reason, which is Donald Trump didn't accomplish this alone. He was enabled by a United States Senate, um, which went along with his not only his legislative program, uh, but indulged his behavior. Um, you know, I think it's fair bet that if Barack Obama had um, called upon um, a, um, uh, a military partner and said, we are only going to release the funds that Congress has allocated to you if you do me a favor in connection with my reelection. And we're sort of caught red handed doing it on a White House phone um, that they would have impeached him. Um, and they would have convicted him. Um, and they didn't, they, they uh, objected to the impeachment, they didn't call any witnesses, and uh, with one exception, uh, not a single Republican voted to, um, uh, to convict him. So he had a number of people who had made a calculation that they were better off blinking away some behavior that they considered intolerable uh, in order to maintain power. And if Donald Trump loses by a significant amount, that sends a chill down their spine that they could be next and they're going to need to reform their behavior um, or, or the American public will vote them out. So I think that's, that's the other reason why a significant margin is going to be important and that Democrats should not only stay paranoid, um, but they should feel that every single vote matters this time around. But also in terms of how the nation reacts, this deeply divided nation reacts, where there are a lot of people with guns, there are people who have already threatened violence if it doesn't stay with Trump. And, I, and I'll say again, there's also the question of how the Supreme Court might react if it is called on uh, to um, adjudicate uh, outcomes in particular places. So, so it is critical in your terms, is it not, for those reasons, that uh, that it is a big result for Biden? Yeah, no, it has to be. It, it, it has to be a conspiracy proof um, result, one where no one can say this election was stolen. It was, you know, it was taken under dark of night. Um, I think for the health of America to at least know who we are and what we truly believe and for our leaders to know that as well, there has to be um, it, it has to be a, dis, a decisive result. Mm. I, th I think the other, the other aspect of it, as you said, is true, which is if people think that something's being stolen from them, um, they feel empowered to do dangerous things. Um, the 
Yeah, a, a court in Michigan today ruled that um, it's okay for people to bring guns um, to the polling place as long as they don't use it for intimidation. Um, you know, it, I don't know about you, but I think a lot of people feel that you know, when they see a, a, a gun near them, that's intimidating um, just in and of itself. Of course, there are um, guns so. and guns, aren't there? I mean, there are the, there are the small pistols that might be sitting in a pocket somewhere and there's the there's the rifle that can shoot automatic rounds. It's bizarre. Yeah, yeah. Jeff, it is bizarre for Australians yeah. to actually contemplate this. No, look, when I when when, when I served as ambassador, uh, as you know, I'm, I'm I'm I love my country and have tremendous pride in what we've done. Um, but I've also been candid about the areas where I couldn't explain our thinking. You know, I can't. I can't justify our failure to regulate gun, you know, guns in the United States in the same manner that um, Australia did, mm. um, which is, you know, which would be consistent with our Second Amendment, which would still protect the rights of Americans, but which would prevent um, AK-47s from being in the hands of teenagers and resulting in the sorts of uh, terrible mass shootings that we've witnessed. And mm. likewise. Um, I haven't been able to explain why we would spend billions and billions of dollars in four years of campaigning uh, to elect a president when others can elect heads of state with um, much less money squandered, um, fewer special interests involved, and greater confidence in the in the outcome of the of the election. The the count will be unfolding next Wednesday morning, Australian time. What should we be looking for in those first few hours of counting? I think the most important thing will be um, what you see in Wisconsin, Pennsylvania, North Carolina, Florida. Uh, if, if, if Joe Biden is declared the winner in say Wisconsin and Pennsylvania, then there's really no path for President Trump. Or if he wins a state that uh, uh, that Hillary Clinton lost in, in 2016 that has a large number of um, electoral um, college delegates, the uh, uh, North Carolina or Florida, then again, there's really no path. And if that happens early in the evening, then it sets a tone for the evening because all of the networks are saying it looks like it's going to be Biden's night. Mm. Um, if it's very, very close in those elections, in, in those states, and they're saying that it's going to come down to paper ballots that have, haven't been counted yet, then I think there are going to be two very, very different narratives that will be presented. And, you know, and, and uh, I think the president will be arguing that there's a lot of fraud going on, that many of the votes that haven't been counted, if he's, a, if he's ahead, that the votes that haven't been counted are suspect votes. Um, and reflect fraud. If he's behind, I think he may start to, you know, challenge other aspects of voting because he'll be within the margin of error and will, you know, claim that somehow there was fraud connected with the election. But he's already said that he's only prepared to accept the outcome of the election in advance if he knows he won. Uh, so there's, there's that. A third thing you should look for is a disparity between the Senate and the presidential race. It's, you know, it's, it's hard to imagine that anyone's going to vote for Jamie Harris, an African-American who's challenging Lindsey Graham in South Carolina, and vote for Donald Trump. And so if you see a real disparity between the Senate votes and the presidential votes, that is going to trigger a lot of alarm bells about whether or not there has been some um, tampering with their voting systems because we know that the Russians and others um, uh, would be prepared to do that if they thought they could get away with it. So they could, is there evidence that the, that the Russians could actually tamper with the voting process itself? I mean, we know, so we know the part that was played because of the intelligence that has been revealed and reported on it. The, 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 the release of, uh, of the Clinton uh, emails and so on. But actually tampering with the voting process, the, count, the voting count itself. Yes, in, in 2016, the Russians were able to get into the voter registration rolls in 40 states. 
Um, that meant that they were able to tell who was registered to vote for which candidates, how often they voted, and that they could target disinformation messages to them. Uh, there was a very stern warning um, delivered by then President Obama to the Russians that if they tampered with uh, voting in that election cycle, um, there would be significant sanctions brought against them. And in fact, some sanctions were directed against Russia just for what they had already done. Um, it, it is not clear that any such warning has been delivered to uh, the Russian government. And we know Russia's capabilities. It wouldn't take very much just to scramble addresses so that people show up at the polls and their vote doesn't count because they came to the wrong place or their license doesn't match what is in the voter rules or other things that could you know, prevent votes from being counted. And, you know, there are certain kinds of voting machines that are susceptible to, um, um, to, to, um, um, fraud. Being, yeah, being fraud. I mean, being, being hacked and, hmm. and producing fraudulent results. And you see again, yeah, 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 paperback up in audits. Yeah. Well, we don't have automatic paperback yeah. up in audits. So there is a real risk of mischief, um, that people are going to be looking for to see if there's evidence of a, of a fundamental disparity um, in certain kinds of results in certain counties. So uh, what, you're, what, you're, what you're saying actually leads to the prospect that you can see that it might be possible to have um, a result in doubt depending on, depending on how people have really voted, number one, but also secondly, depending on how those votes might have been changed. And you could actually have a very tight result, apparently, uh, which, could, which could be a confused outcome over a significant period of time, all in an environment that's potentially explosive. Yes, and, and with a, um, and, and, and with a incumbent who's demonstrated that he's willing to use all the resources of government to secure his reelection. I mean, he's done all sorts of things that have never been done before by any president, including using the White House as a prop for uh, campaign rallies. So there are there are certain things that would give you caution. And when I said that Democrats are living in great fear, notwithstanding all the trend lines being very much in their favor, I mean, look, the numbers right now are the kind that um, would you know, they're like Bill Clinton running for re-election against Bob Dole kind of numbers, where he won, you know, handily uh, in his re-election. But in this case, no one is feeling the kind of confidence that Bill Clinton and the Democrats felt in 1996. All things being equal, how confident are you that there really could be the triple crown for Democrats? The White House, the Senate, the House of Representatives. Um, well, here's, here, here's what I could accurately predict. Um, I, I, I know with <laughs> using, using the intelligence community terms, um, I would assess with high confidence uh, that Joe Biden will not only receive more votes than Hillary Clinton did, um, uh, but, she, but he will also, um, uh, you know, win more popular votes than Donald Trump by a large margin. I would assess with medium confidence that uh, he will receive more electoral votes um, if all votes are correctly counted. Um, and I would assess with medium um, confidence based on what I know now uh, that all votes will be counted accurately. And what about the Senate and the House of Representatives? And in the Senate, um, if if, if, if Joe Biden wins, um, then the Senate will flip as well. Um, I think Democrats are likely to win in Arizona, in Colorado, in Maine, and in North Carolina. And they have uh, an opportunity to, and, and that would be enough to flip the Senate. I think they also have an opportunity to potentially win one seat in Georgia, um, a seat in Iowa. Um, Maybe, maybe Montana, 
maybe Kansas, uh, maybe South Carolina. Um, that's, that's a lot of extra seats that they may potentially pick up. And I don't think that the House really is in jeopardy. Okay. Um, we, we, we would have, yeah. So I, I, I think if Joe Biden has a good night, then, the, then you'll probably see a wave election. Okay, so, so what might Joe Biden achieve uh, with at least two years of congressional control beyond the electoral reforms that you've talked about? What, what you know, areas like, uh, there are a lot of big issues there. Well, you know, um, to be on, yeah. Sorry? I'm sorry, I lost the signal a little bit. Oh, sorry, sorry, okay? Jeff, yeah, I can. Um, what I'm asking is, what, what would Biden hope to achieve? What would be his big priorities in the first two years if he's got both houses? And obviously his, uh, his climate change policies would be front and centre, but there are a lot of other big issues as well, like to, that, that uh, Australia has a very close interest in, like China. What, what do you think will be his key touchstones that he will use those first two years for? Um, look, I think um, a, a couple things. One is HR1, as I said. Yep. You know, it, it's something that should unify us. We should all, we should uh, election reform after the experience we've been through yep. over the last many elections. Uh, I think the second thing is health care. He's been very clear that, you know, particularly going through a pandemic, you need to have a health care system that works for everyone. And so he would uh, work to not only preserve Obamacare, after it's you know potentially um, uh, ruled invalid by the Supreme Court, but even if it's even if it's you know not invalidated by by the new Supreme Court, I think he would likely um, add a public option to it so that it's a little bit more like what you see in Australia, where everyone has some access to some form of um, of healthcare in the United States. It is just an absolute tragedy in the United States that we have people going bankrupt and dying because. Uh, they can afford health care. Um, I think the, the those would be some of his priorities. I think his other main priority in the first 100 days is he's got to rebuild the the federal government in a number of you know critical dimensions. Uh, and he's going to be challenged by that in the sense that a number of people who had great expertise in government have left. It's been hollowed out. A number of positions were never filled by the Trump administration. And um, the Trump administration has been pretty clear that they are not in the mood to um, assist in a orderly transition and make it easy for a new president to uh, uh, to, to establish a you know a new White House and new agenda. So unlike in the past, where transitions have been very collaborative between uh, even between different parties, um, we don't anticipate that to be the case this time around. So when so you were when you were in, in, in Obama's transition team uh, from yeah. Bush Jr., yeah. uh, was Bush Jr. cooperative? Yes, yes. No, they produced binders of information for us. They had, um, you know, each of the departments had transition sessions. They sat down and explained, you know, what, what they had done, how they had done it. I remember, at one, I'll tell you one of my favorite stories. I, I brought in um, uh, George W. Bush's person who had been responsible for evaluating whether candidates for federal offices could, you know, be confirmed by the Senate. Um, because that was part of my responsibility as special counsel. And I said, so how did you set it up and what did you do? Um, and he couldn't have been better and more forthcoming. He told me exactly how they had set up the system and what they had done. And he said, the one thing you need to know, because he was a big Texan, the one thing you need to know is all these people, you know, have been nominated for the president, you know, uh, you, you go to them and you say, look, the president's in charge of appointments. I'm in charge of disappointments. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Of which now, there would be many. <laughs> yes. Yeah, so, and, and you're, you're signaling obvious, that this will not be the case this time. No, I, I don't anticipate that to be the case. Um, in, 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 it would have been the case, I think, with some of the people who were originally in the White House, um, who came from a more traditional Republican Party, um, those people have left the White House and the people who are in leadership positions generally um, align with um, uh, the approach of uh, President Trump who 
you know, he's a zero sum scorched earth kind of person. It's, you know, um, your, your win is my loss. I mean, so, uh, having to turn around, uh, the first question, I suppose, if you were to take a department like justice, yeah. And, and so you've got to try and establish how far the Trump doctrine has penetrated justice uh, in its de departing from in the way Barr has, has run that department. So question, what damage has been done, if any, and then how do you undo that damage? And I'm just imagining that across a number of departments. That would be a huge distraction, and I would think for much more than 100 days, even without contemplating all of these big policy areas like climate change that he's committed to. Yeah, no, there are, there are 1,600 positions that have to be confirmed by the U.S. Senate. There are another 2,400 positions that the president needs to appoint that um, don't even require you know, the Senate confirmation. You also need to, in some cases, rebuild aspects of agencies that were dismantled in order for them to, you know, take on board these new policies and properly evaluate them and present them for um, either as regulations or laws. There's a lot of work that has to be done. It's amazing what you can do in four years. Mm. Um, and, and, you know, as, um, as my mom used to say, you know, <laughs> when my friends would come over and we'd wreck the house when I was a teenager, you know, it takes hours to make a place nice and it takes minutes to destroy it. Um, yeah. so, can you, can you just briefly reflect on what it was like inside the Obama team in those first heady days in terms of the hopes you all had for America's first black American president? Can you just, the, 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 the mood of that team in those early days in the White House? Yeah, I think the mood was, um, was serious. Um, I mean, we were, we, we, we were, um, we were Obama folks, so we like hope and change, and we're optimists, and we and we like to crack jokes, and we're. But in terms of our our sense of purpose, um, there was a real sense of discipline and seriousness of purpose. We had a lot of work to do. We had limited time to do it. We needed to stay in our lanes. We needed to put um, uh, others first. Um, you know, no leaks, no ego, no drama. Um, do the job and do the job as well and as hard as you can every minute. And mm -hmm. there was a real sense of trust that the people around you had that same ethic. Um, I've, I've worked in some great situations and frankly, the only other experience that I've had that matched that um, was working at the U.S. Embassy in Australia uh, with my colleagues. Mm -hmm. um, but being in the White House, um, and, and being in the U.S. Embassy in Australia, there was a sense of we are all in this together. Mm. We trust each other. We work together. We believe in each other. And it's not about me. It's about the job. Yeah. And what was also prevalent as you went into the, into the White House was that, that Obama was elected on an absolute surge of optimism. I mean, I remember the excitement of that night. Which, which I think probably swelled beyond traditional boundaries. But you've got to ask, what happened? Because after eight years of Obama, enough Americans embraced Donald Trump to put him in the White House. Such a huge leap from Obama to the diametric opposite. You know, we, we actually did a study of that after the election because we were trying to figure out what had happened, you know, had they... You know, they'd re-elected him, you know, handily only four years earlier as well. So, you know, what had happened in the second term that had soured them on Obama? Um, or, you know, was it, was it some other thing? And what we discovered um, just surprised all of us, which is that the people who had voted for Barack Obama twice and then voted for Donald Trump in the key counties that flipped still loved Obama. And so we said, okay, well, you just voted for someone who is committed to trying to undo everything that Barack Obama uh, established as his legacy, um, and you still love Obama? Where's the math on that? And what they told us was two things that have made me, made me see American politics differently ever since. They said what they liked about Donald Trump was what they liked about Obama. 
What they liked about Barack Obama was that he was independent. He was not sort of a, a part of a democratic machine. He had actually taken on the front runner and the establishment in order to win the election. And he had his own way of speaking and his own independent voice. And he was genuine. It wasn't that some clever consultant had come up with that new voice. If you read his books from, from when he was just out of law school, or Dreams of My Father, the voice you hear in that book is the same voice that you heard from Barack Obama. What they liked about Donald Trump was that he wasn't a Democrat or a Republican. Both parties hated him. Um, he was independent. And he was genuinely independent because the things he was doing on the campaign trail, no self-respecting consultant would ever tell a politician to do. And the voice that you heard, you know, the sometimes crazy voice that you heard uh, on, the, on the stump were the same crazy things he said in the New York Post um, throughout his career as a real estate developer. And what they were saying was, we just don't trust that the system works anymore. And we want to have someone who we know is independent of this system and is genuine. Now, um, what they weren't asking for were some of the things we've also focused on before, which is experience and competence and uh, commitment to constitutional values and norms and an empathy uh, for others. Um, they, they, were, they were so frustrated with our election system and the choices that they were receiving that they were prepared to go with someone simply because they were who they were and they weren't you know, owned by the party. So here's the big question for the Democrats. What responsibility does your party take for the rise of Trump? Handed power by all those disaffected working people who the Democrats were once able to take for granted, who clearly felt betrayed by the political establishment, but particularly by the party that was supposed to be the Workers' Party. Yeah, I think um, I, I think it's true. That two things. One is I think it's true the Democrats um, had started to take their traditional base of support for granted, and had also thought that the issues that they had come up with 30 years ago that neatly divided um, people across party lines um, were the ones that remained front and center for. Um, for everyday Americans. But everyday Americans were going through the biggest technological and economic disruption um, in 100 years uh, with globalization and with um, uh, new technologies. And new technologies were really what was driving the globalization. It wasn't a matter of policy. It was just we now have the ability to be everywhere simultaneously. Um, and that, that was what was front and center for Americans and they were counting on Democrats to be the voice for their, uh, their frustration, and they just weren't hearing it. Now, in defense of Democrats, they were just awarded at every, at every turn. Once, um, uh, once Republicans took the Senate, it was just a whole different ballgame. Hmm. Um, I'll give you one example. I mean, there was an infrastructure bill that would have put a lot of Americans back to work and would have allowed us to start dealing with many of the challenges that we faced in the new digital uh, economy. And we had, um, uh, we, we presented to the Republicans, the Republicans said it was terrible, you know, it was the worst infrastructure bill we've ever seen. And then they gave us like, you know, a bunch of changes. And we went back to the president and said, okay, well, we can live with these changes. We can't live with these changes, but you know, we can work with this. And the president said, let's live with all their changes. Let's just live with all their changes. Some of them suck, that's okay. Um, because the only way we're gonna get this thing passed is if we you know, call their bluff. So we called their bluff. We made no changes and they killed the bill. Their bill. Yeah. Um, they, 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 they were committed to not allowing him to get any wins yeah. um, for the American people, period. And so if you're in that environment, um, Democrats weren't able to do some of the things they wanted to do. Um, and I think it's, you know, I think it's going to take a sea change in our, um, in our governance 
for any of those policies to pass. You're yeah. going to have to have a single party for some period of time. Yeah. So, and I'm going to try and squeeze stuff together a bit here because we're getting close to time and I. I've got a lot of questions that I'm going to have to jettison, but I'm also very happy with the tenor of the conversation, Jeff. We've covered good, interesting ground. But um, um, just as a, as a full stop on what you've just said, nonetheless, wasn't Hillary Clinton's... Well, I'll make this as an observation and move on. I would have thought that Hillary Clinton's failure to visit the key battleground state of Wisconsin in the 26th campaign was a classic illustration of democratic complacency. She thought Wisconsin was in the bag, so why bother? Now, if you want to comment on that in a minute, fine, but I want to move on uh, to talk about the fact, that the extent to which truth, which has always been a tradable commodity in politics, but in the age of false news, truth as a concept just seems to have evaporated. I don't know how democracy survives in the absence of truth, the absence of a basic trust, even in documented demonstrable facts. So when Donald Trump stands up as, the, as the, the pandemic is surging again around him and says, we've turned the corner, we're winning. This is gonna be over soon. Uh, and, and his army of followers give him a hearty cheer. So demonstrably not the truth, but these people are lockstep with him. Now, when you take that and impose that as a sort of semi-permanent feature on the American landscape, where does that leave democracy? So, um, first, uh, I won't disagree with you about Hillary Clinton's campaign. Um, never take people for granted. Never take anyone for granted. Um, you know, always, always ask for your vote, and always assume that it has to be earned. So, um, I think it was a mistake. Um, now, on the more significant question that you've asked, how do we survive as a democracy? Um, you're exactly right. Different forms of government have different relationships with facts and truth. Um, authoritarians thrive in a world where there is no truth, there is only what the state says, and then you must believe it because there's no other way uh, to, to exist in that society. Democracies depend on just the opposite. We need to know what the facts are so that we know what's the best course and we can elect people who we trust uh, to put that in motion and to solve problems that are of concern to us. And we need to have a common language of science and fact and, uh, and trust them in the integrity of the system and in the integrity of the people who are sharing the information with us. So kind of truth and trust. Um, this president has, you know, has made no bones about the fact that he is more comfortable with an authoritarian style of leadership. Um, on the very first day as president, when he was inaugurated, he stood um, before Americans and said it didn't rain when it was raining on him. I mean, that, that, that sort that, of set the bar, didn't it? That set, that set the standard, which was that the truth is what I say it is. That is your truth. Um, and he has been consistent with that approach um, from day one. So how do, you, how do you put the genie back in the bottle if and when he's gone? How do you do that? Because what you're really talking about is that whole social media phenomenon, the capacity to manipulate it. And, uh, and uh, the New York Times just recently illustrated it when it reported research that from September 2016 to September 2020, Facebook likes, comments and shares from news articles that regularly publish falsehoods and misleading comment roughly tripled. In the last four years, yeah. that has roughly tripled. So what does a Biden administration do about it? How do you, how do you stop that? You know, the, the nice thing about democracies and people um, uh, is that who are for free people and get to make decisions is that we tend to swing one way or another. We, we fall in love with some idea and then over time, we start to see the warts in it, and we, and then we're repelled by it, and we sort of move back and forth. Um, we are, you know, we've always had some, some segment of, of American society has been prone to um, prefer uh, dishonesty and conspiracy theories and far-flung, um, you know, descriptions of, of, of truth. Um, 
but they're, you know, or, or, or of their reality. Um, but on, on the other hand, you know, that's always been a relatively small group. It kind of flares up for periods of time, and then it shrinks back down. So McCarthyism, you know, we, we, that wasn't that long ago, 70 years ago, you know, there was a communist under, you know, every rock. But, but, but imagine McCarthy operating in this environment using social media the way it's being manipulated today. That's the difference. Yeah. That's the difference, and I'm yeah. not hearing from you how that genie gets put back in the bottle. Well, okay, I'll give you a different example then. You know, we had yellow journalism in the yeah. uh, turn of the century, and that was a reflection of the fact that we had, you know, new technologies, new ways of exploiting it, and people understood that they could get political advantages um, by, by, by using these systems. Um, Similar to what's happened now with the abuse of cable news and the abuse of social media platforms uh, to put out false information and to allow people to choose their own narrative um, and believe things that just simply aren't true um, without proper fact checking. And, you know, th there, there were a whole se series of reforms that came into place um, over the 30s, 40s, 50s, where you really started moving towards extraordinarily responsible journalism. Um, you know, principles like this has to be confirmed by two independent sources and, you know. These uh, days it's supposed to be three. <laughs> yes, these days it's supposed to be three, but, uh, you know, as, as you know, pretty much people are publishing anything that has absolutely no basis in fact and has no confirmation whatsoever. Hmm. Uh, I think we're going to move back into a period of integrity because there is, there is always great value for human beings in having accurate, timely, relevant um, information. And people will pay for that. And they will start to know when they're not getting it, and they will get sick of um, losing because they have the wrong information, and they will migrate to the right information. So over time, it works. But you know, we're in, we're in the midst of that transition. Jeff, uh, I, this, this is a fascinating discussion, and, and to me, an important one. But uh, one of the big things for Australia that I've uh, that that I'm getting to just as we come to the end of the conversation, and you're not going to do it in a minute, but China. So we, Australia has found itself absolutely the ham in the sandwich between, uh, between um, uh, a Trump policy on China, which has been very unstable. It's changed not from day to day, but it's been uh, often a very belligerent one. And Australia, it seems to me, has been, as the, as the, as the great ally, has tended to swing far much more behind that policy in the extent to which it is becoming, uh, showing its own form of belligerence to China, even though China is our biggest trading partner and is hugely important to us in our own region. So you know the situation here, you know how important China and America are to Australia. How do we play that? Let's say you get a Biden administration, is he gonna be, is he gonna be tough on China as well? And will you just automatically expect Australia to fall in? I think, I think, uh, Vice President Biden, if he's president, would be um, smart on China, which is a little di different from tough. Um, I think we've been tough on them in the wrong ways. So, for example, you know, I'll, I'll give you one example which shows you the difference between tough and smart. Um, we were being smart with the Trans-Pacific Partnership. The TPP was a way of not only ensuring that there were rules of the road uh, for trade relations among a number of prosperous countries, Australia, the United States, Japan, Canada, you name it. Um, but also, it was a way of creating a market which was irresistible to China that it would have access to only if it was prepared to reform some of its own trade policies um, where it had tried to abuse its leverage with respect to partners in the region. That was, you know, that was the real benefit. China desperately wanted the TPP to go away and wanted the U.S. out of the TPP. Um, so when President Trump, not only did he campaign on you know, getting rid of TPP, but once he got elected, instead of saying to China, okay, now I can, I can get out of TPP, but I may not do it right away. In fact, you know, I may want to toughen it up a little bit, or I may just want to get rid of a couple of cosmetic things. You need to negotiate with me. Um, and gotten a whole bunch of trade concessions from China in exchange for the U.S. agreeing ultimately to withdraw from aspects of TPP. Instead, he just unsigned it that day, asked for nothing in return. 
the, you know, the greatest deal maker, the person who wrote the art of the deal, got nothing from China on trade. And so then later on has to declare a trade war with China. Um, that was just, it was a blown opportunity and a really, really dumb move. I, 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 that, there's no other word for me to describe it. Uh, so look, rule of law is gonna be the key and alliances are gonna be the key. If you have a clear set of common set of rules and commitment among a group of like-minded countries, um, that is a way to you know, have a real conversation with China where you know, you're not being tough on China, you're just finding common ground where everyone, everyone benefits. Um, you know, where there is you know, a, you know, our, our style of win-win. Yeah, and so last question, where is Australia in that? No. Would you? I mean, oh, there there is this sense that there is an automatic expectation in Washington that where it goes, Australia follows. We followed into we followed into Vietnam. We followed into Iraq. We followed into Afghanistan. We've been so on, and uh, and and with this pot, this sort of up down round around policy between the White House, the Trump White House, and China, Australia has clearly changed its attitude and approach too. I, I think Australia follows its values, but Australian values are much more at risk based upon China's current course than, frankly, America is. Look, America, we're, we're the largest economy in the world. Um, we don't live in the same region. Um, we're not you know, subject to hegemonic influence from China. Um, so we have, we have strong strategic interests with respect to China, but not nearly as urgent as the ones that Australia has. And where we align on values is where I think Australia and the U.S. will find themselves working closely together. You know, we have great concern about China establishing surveillance states through, throughout the region using 5G and other infrastructure and using their Belt and Road loans as a way of sort of capturing countries um, as basically hostage countries by threat or by debt. Um, in, in, a, in a manner which um, destabilizes Australia's um, uh, own relations in the region and its own prosperity and security. So in those ways, I think you know, Australia and the U.S. are going to be aligned. It's not going to be the U.S. dragging Australia. If anything, I think Australia is going to be you know, tugging on the United States because these are interests that we share, but they're more urgent, I think, for Australia. Jeff Bleich, in the shadow of the election, this has been a fascinating conversation. Thank you very much for sharing it with us. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning. I'm Karina Gekhi. I'm the CEO here at Hot Art Home of the Arts. And it's my great privilege and honour to give the vote of thanks this morning. Kerry, when we had a cup of coffee before, we both reflected that it's 7.30 in the morning here and I expected you to ease into that conversation but you went in all guns blazing saying so tell me when was the US strongest as a democracy <laughs> which just kind of opened up an amazing and insightful conversation and I think it's a good question for Australia to continue to ask ourselves as well. Um, Jeff I feel torn. I feel as though you've given us insights, analysis, context um, within the US, given us hope based on your insights and data, but then you backed it up with talking around um, innovation in uh, the electoral system, trickery, and um, being allowed to take guns when you vote. Mm -hmm. so, so it's a difficult concept for us to imagine over here. What I will say is that I think we do have hope based on today's conversation. Uh, we wish you well. If it doesn't work out for you, then I am absolutely confident that Australia would welcome you back with open arms. <laughs> Stay well. Uh, thanks, everyone, for joining us today, both here at Hodder but also virtually. Carolyn Evans and the Griffith team are magnificent, as are the Hodder team. And an open invitation to join us on the 24th of November for another conversation. It will focus on the impacts of COVID through cultural, social and medical lens. May COVID leave us soon. Uh, good morning, everyone, and enjoy your day. Thanks, Jeff. Thanks, Kerry. Yep. Thanks, Karina. Thank you.